Welcome to the Biobalance HealthCast, episode number 328, Botox, off-label use of drugs by physicians and the FDA. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at Biobalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. This week we're going to be talking about a couple of of, uh, concepts. We're going to be talking about Botox and testosterone in relation to the fact that they're both drugs that are licensed and regulated by the FDA, but that they are used in what is called off-label uses more commonly than their on-label uses. We're going to talk about the FDA and the way that that all happens and the the paradox that that creates within the medical community, the insurance community, and the pharmacological community. But I want to start by reading uh, something from Time Magazine, uh, January 16th edition, 2017. Botox, like testosterone, this is, this is ours. I'll give you the quotation from time in just a minute. Botox, like testosterone, is a truly amazing drug that is mostly used off-label to cure problems that we don't have a medical solution for. Then the Time article says, the off-label use of Botox, like that of any FDA-approved drug, is legal in the United States. That is because once a drug has been approved by the FDA for a condition, licensed physicians are legally allowed to prescribe it for any medical use that they think it could benefit, regardless of whether or not it has been approved to work for that condition. So once a drug is authorized and licensed by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, as a legitimate drug for an identifiable problem, then they say, okay, this is clear. You can prescribe it. You can sell it. You can consume it. Then physicians who are trained and licensed in their own right can take that drug and apply it to any other condition for which they think it would be an appropriate usage. That is not illegal. It is not irresponsible. It is not wrong or bad in any way, but it is sometimes controversial because physicians disagree or some physician may have uh, a, a, a situation or an example that isn't commonly found by other physicians and say, well, I, I want to try this for that. For, for instance, Botox being used around here uh, and here. Your, your eyes to remove wrinkles. That's an off-label use no, that's originally. On, it, oh, originally. It was off-label. It was an off-label that. use uh, that they decided to start using people, eye doctors who were using uh, Botox to treat muscle twitches and muscle and spasms in spasms the eye. Spasms in the eyelid. Which would stop the, the, the twitching, began to notice that it also took away the wrinkles. So they began to say, wait a minute, here's a good use for Botox. And they started using it for that. And now, after thousands of doctors have used it and tens of thousands of patients have experienced it, they've gone back to the FDA and say, hey, we want to also include this in the the paradigm for why we use Botox. But now it's only approved here. Here and here. Right. That's Just it. Just around Just the Just around the eye, but it's used elsewhere. It is used elsewhere, but the FDA has now said, okay, well, you can do it for this. But that's what we call serendipity. It, they, they accidentally discovered it in the process of doing something mm-hmm. else. It's also brilliance because the doctor actually figured it out and then talked to other doctors. Right. And that, but, but what I want to I say here is that doctors don't just use stuff willy-nilly. We have training right. in both pharmacology, physiology, anatomy, and we, when we don't have an answer to something, mm-hmm. and we find something that anatomically, physiologically, pharmacologically might work and is not dangerous, then we can use it off-label. So, so then we use it off-label, and it, if it works, that's when we start talking to patients, talking to other doctors about it, that's how the drug companies get these new uses. Well, and doctors talk to each other. I mean, they, they're at the hospital and they see each other and they're going rounds and they're and talking friends. about what they see. They go to dinner because mm-hmm. they're friends and they work together. And so they're saying, oh, by the way, I had this patient came in. I tried this and the most amazing thing happened. 
And they question each other. Well, how did you do it? And why mm -hmm. did you do it? And what caused you to think about that? And what were the results? And have you tried it more than once? And and, and so then the the idea begins to germinate and mm -hmm. spread. And one doctor tells another doctor tells another doctor. And it almost has to happen that way because of the law. Uh, mm -hmm. Drug, drug companies, companies can't the drug talk reps that sell the drugs to the physicians. Hey, we've got this. It's licensed for this treatment, for this issue, and it's really good. And the FDA says, go for it. We think you should try it. They're not allowed to say, by the way, here's 12 other uses for it that are even more productive. They're not allowed to do that. That's mm -hmm. illegal. Uh, but so what, it has to be between the physicians. It's got to be between the physicians. But that's how so many drugs have happened. We first started with herbs. We've now turned into drugs like digitalis. Mm -hmm. So many of these things, digitalis, digitalis is, an herb and, it's a flower. Okay. And we've, and we've used parts of that plant and that we used it for the same reason to help heart disease. So then we've used it and then we isolated it, made it as a, as a, a synthetic molecule and use it as a drug. Right. So basically we've taken all these, these kind of rudimentary treatments and taken them and then use that, made the chemical, use it as a drug, test it, it's approved, that kind of thing by the FDA. But basically when we don't have an answer, uh, so I have a problem with doctors that go, I'm only using things approved by the FDA for that use. Right. So what do you do when you well, don't have an answer? That means they're practicing law, not medicine. Right. Because they're that, trying to keep themselves from having any exposure to be sued. Right. I've, I've only ever done the specific And they're treating themselves mandate. and not their patient. So what do you do when somebody comes in and like when in 1986, when I had, I had an entire nursing home come to me because I had a doctor down the hall, went out of, out of practice, he retired. So I got all of his patients and they're all over 70 and they have paper thin bottoms and nothing works. Estrogen creams burned and everything. I mean, nothing works. So I went to a pharmacist. It's the first time I ever compounded anything and it was testosterone. He said, well, let's use some testosterone on there. It won't make them bleed. It'll thicken up the skin. We'll put it in some Vaseline. He made it up for me. I tried it on the first patient. Oh my gosh. Within miracle. a month, it's a miracle and it's yeah. not expensive. And yeah. you know, so then every one of her friends came in. So, so, so that's how it, it grows. But I didn't have an answer. And they still don't have an answer for that. Right. We still use that for, still the, use for, that for, that, for, for the, that issue. Yeah, for, right. for old, old lady bottom. Old lady bottom. So how is testosterone like Botox? Testosterone is licensed by the FDA mm -hmm. for a particular use. What use? For men. Just for men. Just for men. The women, according to the FDA, women don't, don't need, need and shouldn't be given testosterone. Right. And they had one drug called Estratest, which was on the market, but it was the only oral testosterone that we had approved for anything. Not and But men weren't given oral testosterone, but women for some reason were. But it had the side effect, not only did it have the usual side effects of facial hair, but it had the side effect of liver tumors. Because testosterone, when it goes through the liver, causes when it's oral, causes some damage. Not when it's given the way we give it. One of the reasons I give it that way under the skin. Right. But when it's given orally, so they took it off the market that's been back off and back on, back off the market. So basically, it's a more dangerous way to use testosterone. So there are several ways you can They still don't admit somebody. it's our hormone. There's several different ways you can give somebody testosterone. Yes. You can give it to them orally as a, as a pill or a tablet. Yes, you can but that's, put it in a cream and rub it on their bottom. Or that's their a face compounded or way. You can compound it at a compounding pharmacy that way. Okay, but there's no topical testosterone for women. There's topical testosterone for men to for deliver men. testosterone to men, but it has the drawback of making sixty percent estrogen out of that testosterone. So then men get man boobs and and belly fat. That's not a side effect. In I mean. Unless you have a really unusual one in 500 It's not a side problem. effect of testosterone Testin per in a pellet. se. It's the side effect of the delivery method right. of the testosterone. Yes. And that's in... And they can get it in shots. Right. But, but all of these delivery methods have side effects that are pejorative or negative, except the pellets. Right. And the pellets really don't have any of those physiologic problems. They don't raise cholesterol. They lower it. They, in general... All of these are in general. Everybody's a little different. They um, not only take care of multiple complaints of aging, but 
they also they also give us our sex lives back, which is part of the aging process. But things that we use multiple drugs for, like depression. I mean, I didn't I didn't know that testosterone pellets were going to help um, autoimmune disorders because in my training with Dr. Tutera, he didn't say anything about that. But then I had patients coming in for other reasons who came back and said, you know, my rheumatoid arthritis has stopped, stopped progressing or my MS has stopped progressing. It's going backwards. I'm feeling much better. I don't need to take those drugs anymore. Right. So I learned that way. Then I went and looked for the research and there is research on it. But that's exactly that what we're this. saying. The FDA approved it for a particular use. With men only. For a particular population. Mm -hmm. And then doctors have experimented with other ways to use it. Mm -hmm. And then patients come in and say, this is happening. Can you explain that? Mm -hmm. And they learn, well, wait a minute. This is why that's happening. Right. And, and, this is, and we have to go and back and figure it out. Yeah, you have to go back and figure it out. And now it, it works so consistently by helping patients who have autoimmune disorders that... That's one of the things that we say that we can help with. But we have many things that we use testosterone for, none of which except testosterone for men for ED and for sexual drive is approved. That's all it's approved for. So they're looking for a drug right now for women that is uh, similar to uh, ED drugs for men. But, but, but we don't the, need ED. It's not the same issue. No, ED so drugs only ED are drug. for function. For blood flow. Blood flow. All, as long as we have um, vaginal estrogen, then we have the ability to have intercourse. Okay. Because that keeps the vagina Soft from and being pliable, moist dry. And yeah. yeah. And uh, it allows it to be lubricated. And we don't, we don't have the same problem. We don't have to sustain an erection to have intercourse. So, so then the question becomes libido. Sex libido drive, is desire. right, and libido is. See, I don't understand why they're doing that. I don't understand why they're looking for something we already have. We already have, but and it's that they can't. They can't go to the FDA with pure testosterone and say, "We want to test this for women, for sex drive, for two reasons. One, they tried it with a patch, and the FDA." negated it because it might cause facial hair. Now, facial hair is a cosmetic issue that we use wax or whatever for. That's not a medical problem. Well, and so and if the choice were given to the individuals who had to choose between having a sex drive and a keeping their marriage sex life, together, keeping their marriage together or having facial hair that they had to work around. It's a no-brainer. We we will we'd rather go get waxed or wax ourselves or pluck or whatever, but it's not it's not a beard. Later. Laser, yeah. you know, there are things you can do for it that aren't that aren't dangerous. Yeah. So that that's what they they threw out the testosterone patch for. So no other company is, and it wasn't pure testosterone. It was a it was a testosterone like drug, but still, it didn't. I mean, they threw it out for no reason. Right. So nobody else is going to take testosterone to the FDA and say we need this for libido because. They already know they th that other company spent all this money and got thrown out after all these trials. Mm -hmm. And the trials were very successful. So the FDA just doesn't want to give testosterone to women. Right. I think it's because that makes us live longer and healthier. And then <laughs> anything that makes people <laughs> you in the live longer. Theory. Well, everybody yeah. that lives longer costs more to the government. So, I mean, I'm just saying it is the FDA is the government. So in preparing for this conversation, you made a statement that I made note of, and I'd like to bring it up and ask you to address it. Because uh, we're talking about comparing Botox and testosterone in terms of their journey through FDA approval, their uses, the discovery of new uses by doctors who are treating different off-label conditions and so on. Uh, they have similar parallel histories and stories, and it's, it's interesting. But you said comparing testosterone pellets to the risk of Botox is like comparing drinking water to drinking gasoline. That's true. So can, can you tell me what you mean by that? Well, testosterone is our natural hormone, and if given non-orally, really has very few side effects. It is side effects that when we were younger and had a lot of testosterone, those are the same, those are the same side effects. So basically, it's not, it's not dangerous. When you look at Botox, it depends on how who's putting it in, where they put it, 
If you put it in the wrong place, you're going to have eye droop for three or four months. If you put, I mean, well, let's, there's let's, lots what of is different. Botox? Botox, Botox is, is a poison. Is a poison. It's, it's, it's among plus, the most virulent toxins that we've and, discovered yes. in the universe. Sorry, I skipped over that part. <laughs> <laughs> so testosterone is not a poison. It's a natural it's a substance natural. that all of our bodies make, men and women both. And so when we produce testosterone, even artificial testosterone, mm -hmm. and reintroduce it into the body, that there's no poison there. There's no negative affect. And so when you compare the two drugs, testosterone and Botox, as, as to their journey through the FDA, mm -hmm. their usability, their off-label use, and you say, well, there might be some side effects. The side effects that are potential for Botox being misused, inappropriately used, it, are and severe. And it, it depends on the person putting it in. Yes. The person that's injecting it. So if they're not completely trained, if they just say, oh, just mix this together and put this in here. If they don't know the anatomy of the face or wherever they're putting it, you can have terrible results, which is why when they're having Botox parties, I just couldn't believe people would do that because they're letting That's somebody so they who may it. not be skilled, who's not a nurse or a nurse practitioner, putting this in right. who can't handle the complications. Which could kill a nerve. You need well, to look like Guillaume Barre uh, for months yeah, or but, forever. But if they're, you, you know. I droop. I droop if you're if you inject it into a, uh, the bloodstream, right. that's disastrous. Yeah, you know that that gives you this toxin throughout your body. That's terrible. I mean, it can paralyze a muscle and paralyze the nerves that go to it. So, basically, you can be disfigured. We don't encourage either Botox parties or testosterone parties, parties at no. home. We do not. You, you need a, a, a licensed professional who knows at what the they're doing and been in trained in a clean environment. Yes, but but this is so. You have a poison that we use all the time for lots of different things. We're even putting it in the bladder now. We're putting it in. I mean, I don't, I'm not against using Botox. Yeah, to, to stop the it. bladder incontinence from spasms. Yes. Um, like we, when you sneeze, when older people sneeze, they have leakage. Uh, they wear depends because when they cough, they sneeze, what have you. But, uh, but even without doing anything, the bladder spasms. Yes. And that is what the Botox fixes, is the spasm. Okay. and But you, we use it now for uh, migraines, ha injections back here. We use it for uh, depression. They found that it's now being used for depression. If you do a, a Botox injections in the forehead, people are no longer as depressed. Wow. So that's uh, these are all off-label uses. Right. But people, but doctors are using them. Doctors who know what they're doing. We're not saying Botox is dangerous in the right hands. It's not. But comparing these two, and they give all these different the new uses for Botox, and they won't even let testosterone for women into into well, the world. We are saying testosterone in the right hands is never dangerous. Right. It, it's not going to cause dangerous. a stroke. It's not going to cause cancer. It's it lowers not cause cholesterol. A heart attack. Uh, it's going to help you. It gets a lot of bad press. It does. And I'm not sure where that comes from, except that there's, I don't know where that comes from, but it gets a lot of bad press for no apparent reason and use it used for aging and all the symptoms of aging and all the diseases of aging, preventing that is it, it's very important to use testosterone so that we can not be sick as we get older. So I'm looking at it as a completely not com it's completely positive. Absolutely. The and, benefits and the reason, outweigh the tiny risks. The reason that we decided to have this conversation is because we read the article about Botox in Time Magazine. And the parallels between the legitimization of it, the authorization by the FDA, the limited use and exposure uh, are similar. And the incredible number of positive uses that have been attributed to or found to work with Botox in a similar way, have been found and attributed to work with testosterone. And so what we are hoping is that the FDA and other physicians will legitimize testosterone, especially for women, in similar ways to the fact that they legitimize Botox. So it's, it's a good comparison to make because of all of the similarities that we have identified. And hopefully you will put pressure on your physician, on your uh, congressman, to uh, instruct the FDA to do a better job of what it's supposed to be doing and legitimize these medicines they were, they, for it people just, to use. They were just talking about um, 
decreasing the ability of physicians to use off-label drugs. Yes, the that, FDA I mean, aggressively wants to do that. They keep trying to have more power, more power, more power, right. which you, then you can have a computer be your doctor. But, I mean, if that's the right. case. But this that's what we're trained for. That's why we have to be smart. That's why we have to be trained as long as we do is because we have to know how to innovate. And that's where all the changes come from. So we... We can't have the FDA have more power or we will have less ability to fix things less that there medicine. is no drug for. Yeah. And that's what we're doing with testosterone and Botox. All right. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.